We've been going through um, John's epistles these last number of months, uh, took a pause during Advent, and um, today we are coming to the last of John's uh, epistles, 3rd John, and um, I pointed out last week that there's a there's some real continuity between uh, each of the epistles, and, and a large reason, reason for that is that, that John is uh, writing these epistles usually within about a, a three to five, three to six year time frame um, to the churches which he's addressing. And uh, as I'll point out uh, in, in, in a little bit, um, there's, there's, there's reason why I think it's valuable for us to kind of go over them one after another. And, and uh, so that's been the process um, that we've been um, unpacking God's word together. Uh, for those of you who are uh, new here, that's how we tackle the word of God. I mean, obviously we'll do, we'll do topical once in a while, but primarily we love to uh, go through the scripture in the context in which it's given to us. We believe in expository preaching, so we, 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 we want to present God's word uh, verse by verse and, um, and then apply that to our lives and see what we can learn about God, about ourselves, and how we ought to live in this world that God has called us to live in. And so uh, this morning we, we come to the last of John's epistles. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn there uh, with me, uh, you can go to uh, 3 John together and we'll jump right into our text uh, together today. Uh, 3 John um, we're going to start in chapter 3. Yeah, okay, good. Just making sure you know there's only one chapter in John. If somebody's ever preaching from 3 John chapter 3, it's a good time to leave the church. And so uh, we're going to look at 3 John, look at verse 1 of chapter 1. Uh, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Let's just pause there for a moment. The Apostle John opens uh, this epistle by addressing a, a man by the name of Gaius. Uh, Gaius is likely a leader uh, in the church. Uh, that is addressing, and John clearly has a, a, a uh, admiration, a respect, a love uh, for Gaius, and recognizes his leadership in the church and how that is impacting the church uh, to which he is he is leading. As we will see in this epistle, Gaius is commended for his faithfulness um, and also for uh, his hospitality towards traveling missionaries. Obviously, we'll see that, um, and, and we saw a lot of that in, in First and Second John, where they're, they're called to love one another within the body, right? And then as we come to Third John, John is um, commending them for extending that love and that care and that hospitality to, to missionaries and mission, uh, ministries that are passing through. And, and it's kind of commending Gaius and, and the church for their willingness to extend themselves uh, to these other ministries. He says this in verse 3, he says, For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. He says, I have no greater joy than, than to hear that my children are, are walking in the truth. Doesn't that sound familiar? It's kind of what we saw uh, him mention earlier on in his second epistle. Um, as I started to allude to before, one of the, the values of, of teaching through the epistles one after another is it allows us to see a progression of growth and maturity that's the result of the response of what the previous epistles uh, presented to them. And so John addresses and presents truth to them and, and, um, and, and challenges them to grow in certain areas. And then we get to kind of look forward uh, uh, in time after they hear those words and then begin to apply those words. And then we start to see a, a progression of, of maturity uh, and growth, right? And that's always fun to see, isn't it? Like, is, is it nice to you, 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 you invest in someone's life, right? And you, you share some, some things with them. You, you kind of pour your life into them. And then maybe you don't see them for a little while. And then you look back and you see them putting in motion the things that you've been teaching them. And it's like, that's the beauty of, of discipleship and and so as we, as we go through this epistle, um, I notice something that, notice what John says here in, 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 in um, this verse. He says, I rejoice greatly to hear that you are walking in truth. He said, I have, no, I have no greater joy to hear that my children 
are walking in truth. And so it's, it's interesting. It's, not, it's no longer a future reality, but it is now, it, it is something that he has heard back that they put in motion that which he has been appealing to them all along. He opens the second epistle, if you remember last week, uh, with the same goal, but, but it had a little bit less emphasis. And in the second epistle, he opens up with like this. He says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And so again, the appeal is there. It's just a little less emphatic, right? There, 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 there's been progression that's been taking place. In the first epistle, we'll see that John will take the first chapter and a half in, in appealing to the church to, to walk in truth. It is an instruction. It is, it, is a, it is an appeal to walk in the light, right? To no longer walk in darkness, but now to, to walk in the light as he is in the light. He is instructing them. He is appealing to them in the first chapter. Seems like they're getting it a little bit more in, 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 in the first epistle. And it seems like they're getting it more in the second epistle. And then he's recognizing and celebrating it in the third epistle. He says, and let's go back over at first, uh, first John chapter one. He says this, look, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then here comes the appeal, verse, chapter two, verse six. Whoever says he's in, in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And so again, what starts off as an appeal in the first epistle is seen in some of them in the second epistle and then is celebrated as a reality in the third epistle. It's nice to see them getting it over time. And so, does that mean that everybody was walking a lot? It was, it was walking in truth? Of course not. Clearly, there, there is no church that everybody is walking in truth. And the reality of it is it wouldn't have been a very healthy church if they were all walking in truth. You say, why in the world would you say that? Because churches aren't to, have to, aren't, to ha aren't to be full of all completely mature believers. A healthy church ought to have a whole bunch of people at all different stages of growth and levels of growth where we're, where we're pouring into one another. We need our young and mature believers to be growing at a pace that, and, and, and our older ones pouring into them, it's just like in our family, right? We have our younger ones and our, our medium age ones and our older ones, and they're all kind of pouring in, right, into each other. And so a healthy church doesn't mean that everybody gets it. It means that we're all kind of walking together, walking, marching and, and looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith. And, and so it wasn't that they were all walking in truth, but here's the thing. Enough of them were that it created a culture of them walking in truth. It was, what they, it was what they knew they ought to be walking, and John is, is commending them for being people who walk in truth. Right? That's the goal, to see everybody growing. To walk in truth means to, to apply or to live out truth in our lives. That's what it means to walk in truth. It means, that, it means that truth doesn't just reside in our head or in our heart, but it, it, it finds itself and manifests itself in our daily living, in our daily decisions, in our priorities. And so what John will do is he will present to the church a, a couple of examples in this short epistle. He'll, he'll present a, an example of, 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 of some things that we ought to follow, and he'll present some examples of what not to follow. The title of my message this morning is Contrasting Attitudes Within the Church. Have you discovered that there are some attitudes in church? Oh, come on now. Have you discovered that there's some attitudes in church? You know, when I say there are some attitudes of church, right away we start to think, well, yeah, there certainly are some bad attitudes in church. But the reality of it is I didn't say bad attitudes. I just said everybody's got an attitude. It could be a good attitude, by the way, right? And so what we see here is there's, there's two attitudes that John will deal with within the church, right? And so it, 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 we, we'll see a bad attitude, but we'll also see some good attitudes. We'll see some attitudes that we are to follow after and some attitudes that we are to push back against, right? Some that we ought to, um, we ought to um, um, uh, uh, repeat and other things that we need to rebuke. So it's nice always to talk about somebody else's attitude. That's what we're going to do this morning. 
But maybe, just maybe, we'll find that as we look at some of these attitudes that are in the church, we might find, might find that some of the ones that we are to repeat as well as some of the ones we are to review kind of reside in each and every one of our hearts if we got real honest. And if we'd allow the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God to to bring to the surface some of those things, we would grow more and more into the stature of Christ. And that's that's ultimately the goal, right? And so... um, Let's take a look at verse 5 uh, through 12. I'm gonna, I don't want to lose you in the reading this morning, but I think uh, for, for help us to know where, how we're going to go, uh, I want to take a, this, the, the bulk of what John will say, and then we'll circle back and, and check out some attitudes that, that exist within the church. Not our church, but their church. Um, look at verse 5. Uh, he says, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are. Not strange. But strangers as they are, although they might have been strange. <laughs> I was going to say, there are some strange people in church too, by the way. I'm just going like, like, to put that out there. Uh, not everybody. They, we're probably one of them. But all right, let's, let's circle back. Um, <laughs> Beloved, it is a faithful thing that you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers of truth. He is, he's commending the church for acknowledging and, 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 and caring for and showing love and hospitality to those who are serving and ministering and, and missionaries that are passing through the church. He's commending them for that. I have written something to the church, but... Theotrophus, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. How many know Diotrephus is someone we're going to look at as someone not to be like this morning? He says, beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate what is good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius, on the other hand, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. Okay, so John, John opens up celebrating the good things that are happening within this church. He's, he's highlighting the love and the hospitality and the care that is being extended to each and every one of them, right? He is, uh, he is, he is commending them for what the Bible calls hospitality. We all know what hospitality is. It's when a host extends themselves to ensure that a guest feels welcomed, right? Prioritizes the people in the room. Now, for some people, that, for some people, they got to really work at that. That doesn't come natural, right? It's one of those things where they got to really make an effort to do it. Other people that have the gift of hospitality, how many know people have the gift of hospitality? It's just like a reflex. They have the ability to make everybody feel like they're the most important person in the room. Everything that goes on, it's just like they have to love on them and serve them and care for them. That's a wonderful, wonderful uh, person to, to have in your, in your life, right? Um, what the scripture talks about is, and what we see before us is, uh, is biblical hospitality, which there's not much of a difference, but there, will, but there is a difference. Biblical hospitality is much like hospitality where we're wanting people to feel loved and valued and cared for, but the difference is the goal is they walk away being impressed by Jesus and not the person doing the serving. See, the difference between biblical hospitality and hospitality is the goal is to turn or or to to leave the fragrance of Christ even more than just leaving a good impression about ourselves. I think there's a big difference between the two, right? And I think that's what the scripture calls us to do. Obviously, out of genuine, genuine love and care and desire to build relationships, but we want people walking away going, wow. God is really pretty, God is really cool because here's the thing, God wants people to feel loved and valued and cared for 
And how does he do that? He does that through his people, right? It's not like God you know, comes out of the sky and gives them, you know, gives them the, the, the big hug. He does it through you. He cares about them through you. And John was commending the church on the way they treated, they treated these, these fellow believers, these that they didn't even know. These, as he calls them, these, they, he says, they, they, he says uh, it is a faithful thing that you do in all of your efforts. For these brothers, as strangers as they are, they testify of your goodness and your generosity and your love for them. They sent these servants of God out in a manner worthy of God. I like that. In other words, they sent them out in the way that Christ would have sent them out, in the way that Christ treats them. And John concludes these thoughts with the instruction to to continue to support people like that. For in so doing, he says, you become fellow workers, co-laborers, partners in the gospel and in their ministry. What a great instruction for us to remember as we come alongside missionaries and, and workers of the gospel, those who are out there. You know, God, God doesn't call everybody to go out on the field, but here's the thing. God calls everybody to be engaged in gospel ministry. And there are senders and there are goers, right? And when I, I, just, I just think of uh, a couple months ago when we had the team of uh, teens that came in from Uganda, all right, how incredibly blessing, what a blessing that was. And, and just to be able to support them and come alongside that ministry, what are we doing? We're doing more than just giving them money. We are, we, it's like we're on staff. We're beneficiaries of the blessing of that ministry when we partner with one another. That's what the scripture says. It's the biblical principle of, of, of partnering together in the gospel. So profound. So now that he's addressed the church, he, he presents uh, these two examples within the church. Again, an example to follow and an example to avoid. So we take a look first at Diotrephes. Um, what's so difficult about Diotrephes is he's not a false teacher. He's not an unbeliever in the church. Um, we're, 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 we're led to believe very clearly that Diotrephes was, was a believer in the church, an influence, maybe even a leader in the church, but he wasn't an unbeliever. And so sometimes if it was an unbeliever or a false teacher, those are easier to deal with sometimes, right? Diotrephes didn't have a, Diotrephes didn't have a theology problem. Diotrephes had a character problem. Diotrephes had a, had a maturity problem. And so what we have contained for us in the scripture, listen, is not everything there is to know about Diotrephes. But what the scripture provides for us is what we need to know to to help us to understand what John is going to be addressing. I'll I'll talk more about that in a moment. But but the reality of it is, it's it's hard to, to deal with people like Diotrephes because when you're dealing with believers, how many know that believers can be really hurtful? Right? Why is that? Because our expectations are really high and our guard is really low. And when our expectations are really high and our guard is really low, when imperfect people do imperfect things, it hurts twice as much. And my guess is, like me, you've been on the receiving end of that and you have been on the giving end of that. Because we're all growing, right? And so others have caused pain, other, and at times we've been the cause of pain. And that's why it's important to, 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 to exercise humility and, and be quick to apologize and, and make things right. But Diotrephes is mentioned as someone who, who had authority in the church, but, but he didn't steward it very well. And so we have this snapshot into his life. A couple of things that we see in Diotrephes that, that highlights his, his bad attitude, his, his immaturity, his ungodliness. Look, he says, Diotrephes was a man who, who lo- he loved to be in control. How do we know that? Because he rejected authority. That's what John says. He rejects my authority. And when people reject authority, the reason is because they want to be the authority. They don't want to be told what to do. And so we see about this about him, that he was someone who loved to be in control, rejecting authority, and he manipulated others for his own gain. Well, some will say, how can you say that a guy like that's a Christian? I mean, you, you mean to tell me Christians act like that? I'm here to tell you Christians act like that. 
because they're, they're, they're a work in progress, right? Just like you and, and me. And again, I, I think that, that, that we, don't, we, we are not told everything we need to know about this man. What we do know is this, though, that John says, when I get there, I'm going to talk to him. Now, I'm thinking John's going to set him straight. I'm thinking that the, the, the spirit of God who began to work in Diotrephes is going to continue to do that work. Now, we don't, we don't have the whole picture, but we know that John doesn't speak about him as an unbeliever. He speaks about him as one who's causing problems in the church. A couple of things that John points out here. Look, he says, number one, he refused to accept the apostolic authority, rejecting those who were sent by John. You know, my years of, in the church, I, I've seen the pendulum swing in both directions when it comes to spiritual authority. I have seen pastors wield spiritual authority to lord it over people, right? To get, what, to, to get out of them what he needed to get to where they wanted to go, right? Where their own, uh, their own motives, their own ambitions are, are more important. And so the people become a tool to get to where they got to go. And you're not allowed to question them. You're not allowed to ask. I mean, I've seen that side of, uh, and that's an abusive um, display of spiritual authority. I've also seen the other side of the spectrum where, where a, a leader doesn't recognize that they do have spiritual authority and they are entrusted by God to, to utilize that spiritual authority in, in a way that is in the best interest of those under their care. And so they don't, want to, they don't want to offend anybody. They don't want to point out sin. They don't want to hurt it. They don't want to upset the apple cart. Because, and what happens is they don't lead well, and it creates all kinds of problems within the church. And so, there, and so there's a huge spectrum on both sides of, of that pendulum that, that, that have taken place over time. But here, here's what every person in authority needs to understand. If God's given you spiritual authority, you've been given a spiritual authority to benefit the people that God has entrusted into your care, not your own agenda. You see, if God's called you to a position of spiritual maturity, it's not to become the, the large and in charge in the church, but it's to become the greater servant. It means that there's greater expectations upon you to, to lead people in the direction that Christ wants them to grow so that they may grow and flourish and, and mature in the way that Christ wants them to. And sometimes that requires discipline, correction. It always, it always requires affirmation and care and time and love reflecting the shepherd of our, of our souls. Amen. What we see in Diotrephes was, was an unwillingness to submit to the authority of the Apostle John. Not only did he not submit to John, but we see secondly, he, he spread malicious gossip, gossip. Wicked nonsense. I like that. Like wicked nonsense. What a strong, I don't like that. Very, quite descriptive, right? It has no sense, nonsense, right? You ever talk to somebody, just, there's no sense coming out whatsoever, I mean, you can just listen to the news. Nonsense, right? It's just no sense whatsoever. He spread malicious gossip, wicked nonsense, and slander about John and the disciples. That's what divisive people do. They try to, they try to gather an audience. right? They try to get people to side. They like to use words like, hey, everybody feels this way. Right, and then when you when you spend way more time than you should chasing after that, that 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 rumor, you find out it's two or three people who are disgruntled over something that they misunderstood. Right, so it's so critically important that that, that we we guard against things like that, malicious gossip. But this is what's taking place in his life. He was self-centered. Number three. He put himself first. This is just the opposite of the servant leadership that we see modeled by Jesus himself, right? Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve, right? To, to make his life a ransom for many. I mean, if anybody had the right to come and be served, it's Jesus. But instead, we, we see him getting down on a knee and picking up the towel and washing the feet of disciples, taking on the form of a servant. But he was self-centered and he put himself first. He, he refused to welcome other brothers and sisters and stopped others from welcoming them as well. 
Probably for fear of being upstaged, right? He sought to diminish the value of others so that maybe so that he could be the top dog. I don't know. But he wasn't recognizing that anybody else had something to say. Somebody else had other valuable things to bring to the, to the, to the community. And so he sought to shut down the flow of ministries and ministers and missionaries coming through. And he got tried to get others to do the same. And then lastly, he says that John, John points out that that attitude was hindering the growth of the church. Of course it was. Right? It creates that us for and no more mentality. Hey, we don't want anybody new coming in. Right? We just got, we got everything just where we want it. I, just, I know where my seat is in the church and God help the person who sits in my seat. <laughs> See, you're laughing, but a lot of you are in the same seat every single Sunday. I can take attendance by whose seat is where. I think it's just, it's, it's a lot. And there's nothing wrong with sitting in the same seat. I know of a church that, that, that one of the pastors complained to me and they said, I don't know how to set this guy straight. We got a, we got a guy in our church that, that he has his seat. And, 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 and there's been visitors that have come in and took his seat. And he's like, excuse me, we're really glad to see you here, but you are in the wrong seat. Can you please go somewhere else? And he's like, I'm, I'm thinking, man, that person needs to be parked somewhere else. Um, you see, these are all characteristics that, that, that John is allowing us to see in him, right? And, and again, I trust this isn't everything that there is to know about the guy. I pray to God, we'll know maybe on someday in eternity. Pray to God, he repented, he grew, he moved on. These are here to see what might reside in us at times. What we're capable of. What temptations we need to avoid. And so before we look too deep into this guy, I need to look at this guy. And to see, yeah, there's some times that I might want to share some information to make me look a little bit better than I really am. I can't, Pastor, I can't believe you do that. Sorry. We need, to, we need to recognize that even within ourselves, we are capable of these things. John points out that this group, that they didn't want any newcomers coming in. And, and I just, I, I just I want to take a moment and just, can I just celebrate and applaud you um, on that point? You know, there, there's, not, there's not a time, there's, there's, some area, there's some areas in our church that we need to grow, recognize that, right? Then there's other areas that we do really well in. And you know what, there's not been a time that I have met a new person in this church that one of the first things they point out that they love about the church is you. They say, well, this church is so welcoming, they're so loving, they're so, everybody's just so real. So, and it's like, what a wonderful, wonderful testimony to the love of Christ and the acceptance of Christ of people. You know, they expect to get that from people that they see on the platform, but when everybody else kind of loves on them and reaches out and introduces themselves, that, that just communicates the value that they have, not only to Jesus, but to us as well. And I, just, and I always tell them the same thing. Listen, here's what I want you to do. If you've, if you've been on the experiencing end of that, then can you please play it forward, push it forward, do the same thing for others, right? Because it's, 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 it's hard coming to a church for the first time. It's hard walking in the doors, right? It's kind of like, you know, it's just like you don't know, like, you know, how big am I going to be singled out? But when somebody greets them the moment they walk in the door and they let them know that they're welcome here and, and they're wanted here, it does make a, a, a wonderful welcoming environment for them to be, to be blessed by the ministry that we have. And so I just want to applaud you that. I think that's a, a great thing that we can never let go of. Never settle for less than that. Never, never leave here without saying hello and welcoming somebody that you haven't, you don't have to meet everybody, I get that. But make sure you don't leave without introducing yourself to at least one person that you haven't met before. If everybody would do that, I think we'd cover a lot of territory, right? Not, not because we're, not for, not for any other reason than it, it, it highlights the value of the person and it's how God loves people through you. And that's really important. So I commend you in that. So what's the takeaway that John will present here? He'll, as disciples of Jesus, we are to submit to and exercise authority rightly. 
We are not to gossip. We're not self-centered. We're not to, not to, to refuse to welcome and celebrate. Uh, we're not to welcome, uh, refuse welcoming other people and celebrating the broader body of Christ, but we are to come alongside them and, and look to see other people grow and flourish in their ministry and in their walk with Christ. And so what we have in this character are um, some bad snapshots in their life that perhaps at times re- could reside in each and every one of us, and that's an attitude we need to identify and then be quick to avoid, right? Yeah. Then there's Demetrius. Demetrius is then introduced, uh, is an example that is presented uh, to us by the Apostle John of the right kind of attitude that ought to exist in the church. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whatever does, whoever does good is from God, and whoever does evil has not seen God. Now, that's the transition that John is making here, right? He's, he's using the, the, the actions um, of, of Diotrephus as a, as, a, as a wrong kind of attitude, and then he's now presenting Demetrius as the right kind of attitude. Look, he says in verse 12, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. Now, there's not a lot that's said about Demetrius, but we know enough about him in this one verse that John points out that he's worthy of us following following his example. However, I think it's very safe to assume that all of that which was said about the church earlier on was best modeled by Demetrius. That's why John brings Demetrius up as an example. And so everything positive that John mentions even earlier on is not only, re- is not only present within the church, it's present in Demetrius. And so we recognize that Demetrius is a good example for us to follow. A couple of things that John points out about Demetrius. Number one, he says, he was well spoken of by all. That's a great testimony. That means he he didn't get involved in the negativity or the gossip or anything that would become a barrier to a healthy relationship. Everyone spoke well of him. I like that. Because in the the contrast is the guy who was stirring things up, the malicious gossip, the nonsense, and Demetrius just knew to, to steer clear from it. And and, and there's the he was so intentional about it that everybody just knew he was a godly man. I just love to, you know, as, I, as, I've, as we've journeyed together to church, there's, there's been so many individuals that I've, I've thanked God for because they've been a part of our church through some of the harder and better times and everything else. And they've been privy to stories and gossip that they have shut down immediately. And I just love that. I think that's appropriate. That's right. It's a, it doesn't mean we ignore questions. It means we direct them to the right source. Right? Nothing will stir up and destroy and divide a church quicker than gossip, right? And so Demetrius was someone, he was spoken of by everybody well because he didn't engage in any negative speech about anyone else. And I like what, John else, what else he points out. He says, he's spoken well of by all, number two, including the truth itself. I like that. In other words, the truth of God's word didn't indict him like it did Diotrephus. It confirmed him. It it, it held him up as a godly example. All that it might be said of our lives that the truth speaks well of us. That our lives would reflect the truth of God's word. Number three, his life was a testimony of his commitment to Christ and his love for the brethren. He was was what James called a a doer of the word and not a hearer only, right? He was someone who who was actively portraying and displaying the love of Christ to everyone. And he was well loved within the church. We saw that in the way, number four, we see that in the way he welcomed and supported traveling missionaries, which is a big part of why John addressed this letter. He provided care for them to to carry out their work, resources, whatever was necessary, whatever he did, it caused the missionaries to look back and say, they blessed us, they took care of us, they showed us the love of God, right? 
He sent them out in a manner worthy of God. Number five, we see that he was selfless. He was selfless. Unlike Dietrichus, he was self, he, 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 who was self-centered, he was Christ-centered. He cared for other people. That's why they all loved him. Right? He put other people first. That's why they acknowledged and recognized him as a faithful leader within the church. And so what, it, so what John is doing in this text for those who were on the receiving end of, of this letter to the church, as well as all of us, that this text has been preserved for over the centuries is he's contrasting these attitudes to guide us in cultivating the right kind of attitude in our church. You see, the bad examples are really good because it teaches us what not to do. And as I said before, if we got real honest, a lot of those bad examples, they lie dormant within our heart And at the wrong moment, at the wrong part of the day, we're capable of letting those things surface. And we need to to give those over to the Holy Spirit to not act out on those things and instead respond like the other example that is held up for us. So a couple of ways in which we can can apply some of these things uh, as we close up uh, is this. Number one, Recognize that leadership is appointed by God for the edification and the growth of the body. That's the way God, listen, unfortunately people equate leadership to importance. Leadership to power. And that may be the way it works in the world, but that's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. Leadership is akin to servanthood. Right? Leadership is akin to, to living for other people. And you see, the reality of it is we're all called to be called to be servants, but God will tap certain people and gift certain people to be leaders so that they can be serving in a greater capacity, in a greater way, the people of God. The, the reality of it is you're, you're serving with leaders that are not perfect. But we're accessible. And I can tell you this, the decisions that are made and, and thought through and put in motion, I can tell you we, we work through them, we talk through them, and, and the, goal is, the goal is always this, will it glorify God and it will, will it cause people to mature in their faith? Because that's, as leaders, when I talk about in this area, I'm, talking about elders, I'm thinking of elders and pastors, when we're looking at this, we're saying, is this going to be for the better interest in the growth of the church? Will God be glorified? And those are the decisions, and sometimes those decisions aren't what everybody agrees with, but you, you need to lead, right? Number two, we see the importance of emulating Christ's selflessness and sacrificial love in our interactions. You know, in the end of the day, we're about displaying the character of Christ, which means it's not about us. It's not about our, our agenda. It's not about anything other than glorifying Jesus and, and holding Jesus up as our goal, as our prize. And to the degree that we put one another first is the degree that we are expressing the sacrificial love of Christ to one another the way the scripture encourages us to do. Another area, number three, is, is, as Connie mentioned before, our ability to get behind other ministries and, 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 and missionaries, Right? We do that in prayer. We do that in support. We do that in team building, right? We do that in building them up. And we seek to do that in, in, as generously as we are in, in, in able to do. Um, it's a privilege and a joy and, and, and a, a wonderful recognition that the kingdom of God does not re, uh, um, uh, d- depend upon what Integrity Church does, right? We are a small part of a much bigger church of Jesus Christ. And so we celebrate that. We learn from that. We draw off of that. We partner with that. And and we don't avoid that or seek to undermine that. We need to be important. It needs to be a priority. Number four, we are to be hospitable toward one another. To seek to communicate value to one another. Why? Because a person is valuable to Jesus. Every person is worthy of dignity and value because every person is made in the image of God. And it is our responsibility, whether you agree with their lifestyle or not, if they're made in the image of God, they they deserve dignity and value before God. We are to protect, number five, and lastly, we we are to protect one another. 
Don't allow gossip and slander to exist. Don't allow gossip to be said in your presence. I always say there's, there's two parts to gossip. There's the garbage, which is the gossip, and then there's the garbage pal that listens to the gossip. And we, we, need, to be, we need to be very careful to, to, to put the brakes on conversations that are not right and appropriate and directed towards the right people. Right? I'm not suggesting we put our heads in the sand and don't ask questions. We just ask questions to the right people. Because as I said before, nothing could, I mean, God's doing a tremendous thing here at Integrity Church lately. It's just so exciting. Week after week, I've just been having such, I've just been blown away by the opportunity to meet so many new people and so many kids. And it's just been, it's been an incredible, we're just walking in a season of blessing and it's been, it's been really good. And, and, I, and I've been doing this long enough to know that these are the times that that's a real threat to the enemy. And if I'm the enemy, I'm going to try and stop that, right? And so we need, to, we need to not be afraid of that, but we need to be on guard, which is what Peter says, right? Be sober and vigilant, knowing that the enemy see, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What's the number one tool in his arsenal? It's gossip. And so we need to be careful to, to guard against. So if somebody brings something to you, say, you know, so what does that look like? When they bring something to you, say, you know what? This really doesn't involve me. Can you, you need to go to so-and-so about that. And now that you brought me into it, can you let me know when you do that? Because, because if you don't, then I'm going to have to do that. Two things will happen. Hopefully that will get taken care of. And number two, that person won't do that again. They'll realize you're not, you're not a safe garbage pill to deposit some garbage in. Right? And so again, we're not, we're not about covering the truth. We're just about directing it to the right location. Right? And so we, we need to protect one another. Let me, let me close up with this. John's final words, uh, verse 13. He says, I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. I find something very interesting here. John ends the third epistle the same way he ends the second epistle, and this, it's this appeal to speak face to face. It's interesting, he didn't send Diotrephus a letter to, you know, bashing him for all the stuff he did. He's like, I'm going to come back and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to have a little come to Jesus meeting. We're going we're to talk this thing through face to face. Because you know one of the things that just, you know, penning or posting does is it doesn't give us the benefit of body language and tone, Right? And so what ends up happening is because we live in such a critical world, we just assume the person is intending to hurt us. And what might be the right, the, the, the right thing to hear, communicated the wrong way, gets lost. And see, if you really value somebody, don't, don't, don't email them, don't text them, right? Don't write, go to them. Love them enough to give them your time and your presence. And if you, and if you don't have the time or you won't make the time, then be quiet. Then don't, don't, then don't say anything, Right? And I just love the principle that we see that John lays out here, the importance of speaking face to face. May we follow the examples of Demetrius. May we run from the, uh, the examples of the other. May we, may, may, we, may we recognize that within our own hearts, we have the potential of walking out and living out both. May we extend grace to others because the same grace we extend to others is the grace that we may be in need of another time, right? May we show the love of Christ. May we be generous with one another, caring, and hospitable, speaking the truth in love, as the church is called to do, right? It's not to avoid it. It's just to do it the right way. And what ends up happening is the church is edified. It's built up. It grows. It matures. And we're protecting Jesus' bride that he loves so much. The Apostle John covers a lot of subject matter in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But it all points back to the same purpose of writing. Where he says in 1st John chapter 5 and 13, these things were written that you might know that you have eternal life. 
And then he goes on and lays out all the things that are consistent with the one who has eternal life. May our lives reflect what God has preserved for us in this sacred text. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that we have been recipients of your grace and your love and your mercy, of your patience and your tenderness. And Lord, help us to be an extension of that to one another. Lord, help us to, um, uh, Lord, walk in love, walk in truth, not seek to cause division, but Lord, to, to walk in unity and care for one another. We thank you. We, uh, we lift you up and we give you praise and we're, we're thankful for what you're doing in our midst. We, God, we ask your, your continued hand of blessing. Lord, give us wisdom on rightly stewarding that which you've entrusted into our care. Help us to shepherd in a way that is a reflective of the good shepherd. Help us to lean on one another and learn from one another and love one another. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen.